All right. We are turning in our Bibles uh, today to Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter number 15. I, I was intending to speak from a different topic, but as I was in some prayer and thinking, I ran across uh, uh, a, a different theme in my spirit that I think is just as important in lightening our load, and it's a theme about faith. And I think that in many respects, if we're going to lighten our load, we have to figure out some ways to uh, expand and challenge ourselves around this issue of faith. And uh, in many respects, many of us may imagine or think that faith is only defined in one way, uh, but I want us to continue to appreciate uh, that faith in and of itself can be understood in at least a couple ways that are going to be important for us today. And so I hope to uh, open that up for us and give all of us an opportunity to imagine what does it mean uh, for us to uh, use our faith to lighten our load. So uh, the book of Genesis, chapter number 15, uh, it should be on the screen. Uh, if it's not on the screen, then you should look on to somebody next to you, but I'm sure it's on the screen. Uh, I think I'm reading from the, the uh, message version. Um, is that what's up there?
particular revelations about God and the systematic ways in which we are called to live into that belief system. And then we have faith, the faith that you and I are called to employ to help us make sense of the things that we know are ours, but we have not yet seen as a reality. Now, part of what is always such a challenge when we talk about the faith as an active agent is that often the, the greatest uh, threat to our faith as it relates to using it as a tool to help us believe is when the promises of God take way too long to come to pass. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, believe uh, what I have been told about God, right? That God is good. Oh, yeah, that's a faith principle. Or that God is righteous, faith principle. I believe that about God, particularly uh, as a concept, as an ideal, as it to be true. And yet, if you and I would be honest, the active agent of belief that would cause you to walk out there in an unrighteous situation and be moved regardless of what you see because you are trying to live out what you know or believe, that active agent of faith can be quite a... a, 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 a a burden to bear. And if, if we're not careful, it can even often be uh, something that runs out. Now, it's always important, I think, to appreciate that faith as the active agent of our belief, the faith described in Hebrews 11, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, that catalyzing agent that keeps you and I believing that if we don't cultivate that faith, that faith can easily run out or at least on fumes to a point where what you see can have more determination over what you believe. Anybody ever been there before? Amen. It's like, now I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm trying to believe, but Lord have mercy. What I'm seeing ain't, ain't necessarily what I'm believing. Or what's happening ain't necessarily what I've expected. You see, part of what often becomes an enemy to our faith is we underestimate the lucrative nature of sin and evil. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but, you know, we read in the passage, I think it was verse number 7, 16, that sin is still a thriving business. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. That, amen. Sin, sin, sin does pay now. And depending on who you are, you can capitalize off of the unrighteousness of yourself and others. But we must appreciate that even as this lucrative nature of sin and evil pays dividend, perhaps in material wealth, it also at the same time is bankrupting the soul. Sin may cause your bank account to swell, but it also causes your capacity for good to shrink. Sin may allow you to be more prone to power and privilege and, 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 and manipulation and Machiavellian uh, schemes. But it will also cause you to have such a compromised moral compass that you won't know right from wrong, up from down, left from right. right. So part of our challenge, or at least part of our task, is to make sure that even as we are moving through our lives, we are not uh, cashing in on the contradiction 
of the lucrative nature of sin, evil, and I will add violence and, and oppression and all these expressions that all of us are too familiar with. I mean, I, I, I ran across this, this fascinating uh, quote uh, from uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, President Ike, if you will, from back in the, I think he was a 50s era president. Uh, and uh, I don't know if they have that quote, uh, but I'll certainly read it. Uh, Eisenhower says that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, just one bomber, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. The lucrative nature of sin and evil will cost us all something. And so part of our work, even as we trying to figure out Locally and even in our own lives, how do we become people who can sustain our faith? Some of us have to opt out of the lucrative nature of evil. Huh. And it's a hard thing to opt out of something that you think is bringing you and I a benefit. Because quiet as it's kept, a lot of us, how we vote just demonstrates how we continue to opt in. The purchases we make continue to remind us how we opt in. I mean, if we're spending 50% of our general fund dollars in the Bay Area on policing and militarized responses to crime, then of course we don't have no money to build no schools and keep parks open all night and, and after school programs fully funded and breakfast programs for our children so they can go to school with some food in their stomach so they're not so twitchy trying to learn trigonometry and calculus and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, for many of us, our fear of the inevitability, or one may even say the boogeyman of crime, will cause many of us to invest more in the lucrative nature rather than in the hope, or dare I say, the faith of the possibility of another way of life. I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, then, that there must be a way for us to start counting differently the costs. Because if you and I can count the cost of righteousness or unrighteousness, if we can learn to count the cost of justice or injustice, if we can learn to count the cost of healthy relationships versus <clears throat> unhealthy relationships, if we can learn to count the cost of, 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 of loving our loved ones versus hating our, our enemies, I believe you and I may have a, a little different arithmetic that could add up to something that actually sustains our faith rather than drains us dry of our faith. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, can you start counting? Can you start counting? So here we have Abram, who is one of these uh, promised uh, or one of these folk who had uh, heard from God that he was going to uh, be blessed. And he was going to be blessed beyond his imagination. Abram was someone who late in life, uh, uh, got a chance to have a initial uh, introduction with God. And Abram, in the course of his late in life experience, 
was was all, always, I think, uh, overwhelmed by the weight of God's promise. Because I, don't, I think it's easier, at least for me, it's easier for me to get a big promise from God when I feel like I got enough time for the monstrosity of the promise to happen. Uh, the, 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 how many know the shorter the timeline, we can easily feel like, okay, I need to manage my expectation. <laughs> Ain't nothing like having a big old expectation and getting a little old. Man, I thought I was, I remember, <laughs> I remember, you know, some of our work, we were trying to raise all this money to help us do uh, some things. This happened many, many times. And someone, anyone ever, ever, <laughs> anyone ever got a promise, but they didn't tell you how much the donation was going to be? So you sitting there and you trying to figure out, okay, this happened very recently. All right, now, you know our budget is $50,000, and, and you tell me that, oh, that is, I'm going to support that. And you like, hmm, okay. Now, you're a little nervous to ask him, like, what does support mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Like, is support, like, you know, a dollar? <laughs> support one of them handshake supports? Is it, you know, and then you're a little nervous to ask him, a, a number, but they know your number. So you kind of sitting there like, hmm, do I need to manage my expectation? Because if my number and your number don't meet, I got a gap. <laughs> Woo, Jesus, and I don't know what to do with this gap, especially if you laid him giving me your number and your check. Touch your neighbor, somebody. So, so, so sometimes that causes you and I to manage our expectation. Because if we keep it real, if God takes so long to do what God says God's going to do, we kind of start wondering, did I hear God right? Maybe that was that bad burrito I ate last night. I don't know. I, maybe it's just me hoping beyond hope. Abram was one of these folk who obviously had to keep being convinced of God's promise. God told Abram the first day, Abram laughed. <laughs> he said, I ain't having no kids. You know how old I am? What's wrong with you, God? I think we could learn some lessons about how Abram talks to God and how we should start talking to God with a little bit more honesty. I'm telling you to try to cuss God out now, nothing like that. But I'm just telling you, don't be, you know, like hedging your bets. God can handle your serious inquiries. Abram, Abram is in this position and he's trying to figure out how this is all going to work. And the first thing that we see Abram being asked to do by God is to, first point in this sermon, if your faith is going to remain cultivated in the sense of lightening your load, you have to learn, we have to learn to start counting. Everybody say start counting. Now, in verse number five, uh, I believe the scripture verse says that Abram is told to count the stars. And then he's asked a fascinating question, can you do it? Which should probably be an important question for all of us to answer. Because the truth of the matter is, while we can count in human terms, how many of you know when God starts asking you to count, God's counting will always be beyond your ability to comprehend? Can you and I learn to count using God's divine formulas? Can we learn to that cause you and I to have an expanded imagination? God tells Abram to look at the stars and start counting. One thing I appreciate about God is that God will always invite you to look at something you are unable to do through your own power. Because if you're trying to count some of them stars up there, I mean, after probably a million, you're going to kind of get lost and confused. Did I count that one yet? 
<laughs> Amen. God, God always invites us into work that is beyond our own capacity to fulfill. Because God wants you and I to challenge our conventional thinking. The thinking that would limit us into the confinement of a broken and fallen world. The, 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 the limitations that would cause you to think that how you identify yourself through these socially constructed categories is fully able to give an account of the depth and the nuance of who you really are. Because I don't show up anywhere as one thing. Mm -hmm. Even though this world may see me as only one thing. How many of you know you and I are more than what the world may see us as? And our job is to not allow the limitation of the world's vision for our lives to restrict us from being able to keep counting. Oh, Lord. I mean, it's, it's such an important idea because how many of you know when you start believing that one plus uh, one does not equal two in the divine uh, formula of God? That one versus 10 does not equal uh, you being outnumbered or outgunned in the divine formula of God. You start to realize what Bishop Blake says all the time, that one plus God always equals a majority. <laughs> Lord, help me today. Some of us need to live our lives with a certain revelation that I know my faith is always finding itself in a contested space, whether it is my belief about who God is or my ability to unleash that catal catalytic force to keep me showing up in the middle of my trials. But whatever it is, I know as long as God is with me, oh, there's no way I can lose this fight. There's no way I am finally determined by what's going on right now because God is eternal time is not an enemy to God time is only an enemy to you and me you better believe that now amen oh I taught my wife had me riding all over uh Chicago on a bike we on vacation praise the Lord and it was a great experience but I was reminded as we biked for five miles with a child lounging in the back of my bike that time is an enemy to Michael McBride. And yet I am so appreciative that this time is not an enemy to God. So the question I want you to imagine is what is keeping you from counting? What is keeping you from expanding your imagination and expanding your faith for the possibilities of promises made by God? I mean, I want you to really think about this for a second. Is it possible that God is welcoming you to count so you can have a catalyzing and expanded faith. That often, as you count, your faith becomes huh, dynamic. It's almost like an act of atrophy. Hello, somebody. When you don't work out your muscle, how many know your muscle dies? So you just doing the act of counting could actually jumpstart your faith expand your imagination and help you to get to a place like Paul says, uh, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can ask or think according to the power at work in me. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him start counting, start counting, start counting. It, 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 the, the, the cultivation of your faith is connected to your ability to count. Lord, I wish I could preach this like I feel it today. 
But let me keep moving. The second thing that I think it's, it's always important if your faith is going to uh, endure or, or definitely be stronger or, or be sustained, you have to endure the darkness. Somebody say endure the darkness. Verse 12, Abram is, is, is very clearly, <laughs> Scripture says, a sleep, not just sleep, a deep sleep, overcame Abram. And then a sense of dread, dark, and heaviness. Now that's a, that's a, a human description of our fragility, if I ever heard one. The idea that we can be overcome by a deep sleep. It wasn't like Abram just said, hmm, I'm going to go to sleep. I mean, the text is attempting to communicate that a deep sleep overcame him. It overwhelmed him, kind of like you standing in the water trying to get only your toes wet. And then a wave comes in and ain't worried about your toes. It wants your whole body. That wave what? Overcame you. <laughs> that wave wasn't cooperating with you. How many of you know sometimes there are factors happening in our life that overcome us? Mm -hmm. And often these are uninvited or unexpected circumstances. That we are not prepared for, not expecting, and our task is not to always try to live our lives in a way that is trying to avoid these things because you can't avoid life. You can't avoid life. Life is life. Is life. How many of you can be doing everything right and here come trouble knocking at your door? <laughs> it's like, man, I thought I moved. I, I, didn't, I didn't even list. I didn't put that new address thing and how chunk of trouble always finding me anybody feel like you a witness to that now I know some of us out here we be looking for trouble I kind of my wife told me that today you on your way to Ferguson mm-hmm <laughs> you out here looking for trouble <laughs> Lord have mercy but part of what you and I are also often forced to deal with is the dread, the darkness, the heaviness that is a result of being overcome by this sleep. So I wonder what is putting you to sleep today? What is causing your sense of dread, darkness, and heaviness? What spiritually, emotionally is making you numb or unaware? I mean, we all talk about how we got to stay woke. Stay woke. <laughs> Get woke. Be woke. Just, just woke. Just. But how many of you know that you can be woke and still get overcome in some sleep? Oh, Lord. Some of the most woke folk I know got some parts of their life where they are asleep. And that should not be considered by any of us because that's all of us. Shouldn't be considered like some, some criticism. We are, at the end of the day, human beings. We are fallible, prone to mistakes. We are not perfect. So even as you get woke, stay woke, be woke, realize that you are still human. And if you lose sight of your humanity, you will carry a burden that will crush you and remind you how fragile you really are. That's why I tell the police all the time, I need to free you from the burden of your impunity. I wish I could talk to somebody. Because it's too heavy a burden for you to bear. You ain't, you ain't intended to be uh, uh, all-powerful. Nobody is. A preacher is not intended to be unaccountable. And when you get unaccountable, you get perverted. 
Mm -hmm. Lord, help me not to be pervert. You and I must learn to endure the darkness. Endure it. Endure it. Because darkness don't last always. How many of you know even, even, even every darkest night, the sun got to come up eventually? So if you and I can just endure the darkness. Now, it's so fascinating because even in our spiritual and religious traditions, we find this conversation around the dark night of the soul. It is this fascinating description of the believer or the follower of Christ who finds themselves in a place where they can't touch God. Feel like their prayers hit the ceiling and come right back down to the floor. It is almost a spiritual crisis that is longer than a couple of hours or a couple of days. Some of the most uh, 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 spiritual uh, giants of, of Christian faith. I, I have a whole list of them, but, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just read a few. St. Paul of the Cross experienced what he called a dark night in the 18th century. And he says it lasted 45 years. Another, many of us will know this name, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. According to letters released in 2007, her, her dark night of the soul, she says, lasted from 1948 to 1997, up until she passed. Almost, they say she, she says she came out of her dark night of the soul, months, if not years, before she passed with only brief interludes in between. I mean, when I read these folk experiences, it helps me to realize that I'm not the only one that is often experiencing moments of darkness. Now, some of us in the church will spiritualize everything that has to do with darkness, and, and we'll, 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 we'll talk about it like depression or trauma, and we'll say, well, if you just pray more, Read your Bible more. Cast out the depression demon and, 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 and all these things that all of this will, 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 will go away. But I want to submit to and suggest to you that we serve a Savior, the Scripture says, who is also acquainted with grief, with, dare I say, depression, anxiety, worry, now, if Jesus now, we talking about Jesus, we ain't talking about McBride. We're talking about Jesus, you know, the one who's God. <laughs> Touch your neighbor. If Jesus is going through the world and he himself is experiencing grief and anxiety, why do we think we will get a free pass? <laughs> now, there are all kinds of reasons why you and I may experience grief and depression and trauma. Some of this is indirect. Some of it is direct. You know, I got to name the names of Corey Gaines this week, who was obviously gunned down in her apartment with her child on her lap by some police officers. Sky Mokabi, trans young woman who was killed by some hateful folk in Joyce Quayway, who was killed by her boyfriend, chained her to a chair and brutalized her to death while someone else watched. Those things should bring us grief. And the continued expression of that publicly should cause some of us to struggle with depression because that's trauma. And how many of you know unaddressed trauma will always lead you to a dark place? So the question for you and I, here we go with this question, are you in a dark place? What practices must we engage to endure darkness and how can, here comes the counting, Help you and I endure. I want to submit to you that depression and trauma has less to do with the spiritual lack of faith and more to do with our well-being. That you and I are living in a world that is troubled 
But we also living with the faith, big F, the promise where God says, Jesus says, in this life you will suffer tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Think about this. Overcome by sleep. Dealing with sense, the sense of dread, the sense of heaviness, the sense of darkness. But then you're met with Jesus who says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Could it be that the counting I'm asking and inviting us to do will help us unlock those moments of cheer and joy? Not because it's happened already, but it's because we can be reminded of the promises of God. President Barack Obama does this well in many of his speeches where he says that we are working to become a more perfect union. It's a fascinating use of words that is just starting to get some appreciation from me because, you know, I've, I've been so moved into a posture of critique against everything. <laughs> that it takes about 10 times for me to get an appreciation that becoming a more perfect, a more perfect union is counting the stars. Because we are naming that we are not perfect, but we are also naming that we are working to become that which we are not. So what are the practices that you must engage this week? If it is indeed the case that depression and these other things are more about our balanced hormones than it is about your lack of faith. It's more about you eating healthy and getting exercise than it is about you swinging from the chandeliers and rolling on the floor. It's more about you doing spiritual practices like prayer and meditation than it is for you preaching a sermon or or, 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 or singing a song, that it's about sometime engaging therapy and medicine, exercise and other life-giving practices, that to endure the darkness of your life means that you have to engage in the practices that bring you life. Hello, somebody. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I will endure, I will endure. You are not called to be your whole life in a place of darkness. <clears throat> it is not the will of God. And I love that God will not leave us, nor forsake us, nor abandon us, nor leave us to even our own devices. But when it seems and feels like we are forsaken, how many of you know God will swoop right in? That's counting the stars. That's you beginning to say, God, I know what your promises are. And because I know what your promises are, even though I'm depressed, I can start counting some stars. Even though I'm in despair, I can start counting some stars. Even though I feel abandoned, I can start counting some stars. Because I know it's in the counting that my faith begins to be revived. It's in the counting that my hope begins to uh, 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 flame anew. It's in the counting. That I realize everything is going to be all right. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, start counting, start counting. The last thing that I want to tell you today then is when in doubt, look up. You ought to tell somebody, look up, look up, look up. I love how God tells Abram, uh, come on outside with me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. How many know God is inviting some of us outside? I mean, even you that are here, we're in a pretty sacred place. I think this church and this building is sacred, but this church and this building still has limitations. But when you go outside, how many know you can see things you can't see inside? God is leading some of us outside of our circumstance because God wants some of us to learn. When in doubt, look up. When you are struggling, look up. Because looking up keeps you focused on what you are counting, not focused on what you are encountering. God's trying to get you and I to, to, to focus on the counting and not the encounter. 
God's trying to get you and I to not be limited by the confinement of our situation. God said, come on outside with me. God tells Abram, I know that, that, that we're, 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 you're in a vision moment, and I know that I'm revealing myself to you right where you are, but how many of you know right where you are is not where God wants you to stay? God will meet you where you are. God will meet you where you sleep and where you sit and where you live and where you work. But God is always inviting his people to come outside. Lord, help me to talk to somebody. Because some of us think that it's only going to happen where we're comfortable, where we want uh, the, the, the healing to happen. But I believe that if you and I can follow God, wherever God leads us, wherever God guides us, we may find a healing and a deliverance and a, and a restoration and a reconciliation we've never seen before. Somebody holler, look up. God told Abram, look up. Why? Because if you look up, you can see my promises uh, all around you. If you can look up, you can see my, my grandiosity all around you. If you look up, you can see my majesty all around you. But if you keep your eyes focused on what's going on, then you will always be limited by what you see. But I'm here to tell you, God wants you to see something you've never seen before. And that's going to require you to go outside and look up. The question then you got to ask yourself, can you follow God's prompting to go outside? Can you follow God's leading to get out of your comfort zone? Can you follow God's direction to move beyond the place uh, where you are only comfortable being? Uh, I know we're getting comfortable in a place of, of consistent rage and fear and anger because of what's happening in the world and what's happening in our family and what's happening in our community. But I hear God saying that if you want to lighten your load this summer, uh, if you want to get a little bit of relief, uh, if you want to get a a little bit of a, of a, of a time out, uh, then you ought to take a little step out. You ought to take a little step uh, outside of your situation. Uh, you ought to take a little step uh, outside of your circumstance. Uh, you ought to take a little step uh, and begin to say the words of scripture. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, it says, lift up your eyes uh, and look to the heavens uh, who created all of this. Uh, it is the God. God, uh, who brings the starry host out one by one. Uh, it is the God uh, who calls forth each of them name by name uh, because of God's great power uh, and because of God's mighty strength. Uh, not one of these is missing. Uh, when God calls you by your name, uh, it don't matter what anybody else has to say about it. Uh, when God says it is for you when God says victory shall be yours when God says no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper then you ought to take that to the bank and you ought to tell the devil I know you got my mind all messed up but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that has my back than the devil that's coming against me. I know you got some weapons. I know you got some armies. I know you got some power. But the weapons I fight with, they are not of human origin. But they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Do I have anybody that believes in those weapons? Those weapons of joy. Those weapons of peace. Those weapons of hope. Those weapons of forgiveness. Those weapons of holiness. I believe in my weapons. Shout hallelujah. I love the word of God where it says I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which comes my help. My help comes.
comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved, but he that keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. You got a God who never takes a day off. You got a God who keeps his promises in the sky. Look up. Count, look up, believe, look up, God is with you, we shall overcome, shout hallelujah. But we got to count. It is the act of counting that defeats unbelief. It is the act of counting that catalyzes our faith. It is the act of counting that neutralizes the depression, the worry, the anxiety. But if you can't count, the devil's already won. If you can't lift up your head and look at what God has placed in the sky. Woo, Jesus, help me to do this. As a reminder of his faithfulness. If we can't do it, we've already lost the battle. And that's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to keep looking at the despair and the evil and the injustice and the dysfunction, the abuse in our homes, the, the fragmentation in our families, the exploitation on our jobs. The devil wants us to keep focusing on that at the expense of being able to look up and say, I'm going to count this star. I, I remember that star. That star said that God will never leave me nor forsake me. That star says... That God is my shield. That star says that God is my healer. That star says that God is my redeemer. Can you keep counting? Can you keep counting until your faith gets itself back on strong footing? I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's easy. I told you about the dark night of the soul. Some of these folk going on for years and decades. But I am blessed by their witness. Because even though it took them 40 years, they could testify that God brought me out of it. One of the great challenges of our generation and our time is that we give up too easily. It don't happen today, and we don't feel like it's worth waiting for. We'll retreat back to those practices that we know are death-dealing. But I want to say to the Way Church, we cannot afford to retreat. God needs your family whole. God needs you whole. God needs our communities whole. God needs this country more just. God needs our world less violent. And it is the job of the church to bear witness every day that the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. It's a continuous process. But there's a few of us that are bearing witness. Asha. That it's got to happen. That has already happened. Come on, stand with me, everybody.